Hey, what's going on you guys? It's Aces High, and today I'm bringing you guys the final battle of our entire Alexander the Great series. It's titled The Battle of Ipsis or Ipsis. Not really sure how to, t uh, how to say it, but basically after Alexander the Great died, he had this vast kingdom. Now his generals, his secretary, just kind of everybody wants to fight over it, and they want their slice of the cake. So uh, we've been watching a six-part series from Kings and Generals on the battles of his successors, and just... It's been, it's been crazy. It's been like 12 years or something like that. Uh, starting, I think it was in like 313, 314 BC, all the way up to now in 301 BC. Um, just watching them fight over and over and over again. Some places trying to stay neutral, like uh, the island of Rhodes, and getting dragged into it anyway. Uh, right now, it looks like the big dog is uh, antag Antagonist. Yeah, Antagonist. Uh, and he... Uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's kind of uh, just taking most of the land for himself. Uh, I'm not sure if he's going to win in the end or if everybody's going to kind of gang up on him. I guess we'll have to see what happens. Um, but anyway, enough talk about that. We're getting ready to watch it. Uh, after this video is done, it's the end of the series, and we're going to move into a couple of single videos followed by a huge series that I believe is going to be on Julius Caesar. Um, so I'm really excited about that. I hope you guys join me and, uh, make sure you hit that sub button, ring the bell because, uh, then you'll be notified. I release seven videos a week at least and you don't want to miss them. Anyway, I'm going to sit back, I'm going to shut up and let's get started. It is 304 BC and following 11 years of almost constant conflict, the great climax to the wars of the successors is fast approaching. Compared to previous fights, this bloody engagement would overshadow all before it. The Battle of Ipsus. Really? Following his failure to capture the city of Rhodes, Demetrius set sail for Greece as ordered by his father. Much had changed on the Greek mainland. Cassander was once again active in the area, and for the past two years, the city of Athens had been fighting a war against this Macedonian king. Although initially successful, by 304 BC, Athenian resistance was crumbling and the city was besieged. Cassander had also defeated the Athenian fleet and now blockaded the city by sea. Athenian capitulation seemed almost certain. But as Athens appeared doomed to fall, News reached Cassander that would alter his plans completely. He learns that Demetrius had landed at Aulis with a large army. Fearful of being surrounded, Cassander quickly broke off the siege hmm. and headed back towards Macedonia. Yet Demetrius managed to intercept his forces near the Calidromo Mountains. And in the ensuing engagement, 6,000 of Cassander's Macedonians deserted. What? humiliated why would they desert does somebody know the history of that i understand that they're on the run maybe they don't want to battle anymore but are they just that scared of demetrius or what cassander and his remaining forces withdrew into macedonia rather than pursuing demetrius now turned his attention to affairs in central greece in the peloponnese the influence of cassander and ptolemy was still formidable and not wanting to leave his forces exposed, Demetrius launched a full-scale campaign in the region. The result was an overwhelming success. Both Cassander and Ptolemy's holdings in the Peloponnese were removed completely. Wow. Demetrius now aimed to consolidate his new gains. Not only did he declare the cities free, but Demetrius made one other critical move. At the Isthmus near Corinth, Demetrius was proclaimed commander of the Greeks, following in the footsteps of both Philip II and Alexander the Great. Nearly all the mainland Greek cities south of Thessaly, except for Sparta, were incorporated into this grand alliance and contributed troops to the young Antigonid's army. His control of Greece was now secured. Having accomplished this, Demetrius then married the Molossian princess, Deidamaya, and thus allied himself with the Epirot League to the west. 
Now he could look north towards his goal, Macedonia. Wow. In the meantime, Cassander had been watching Demetrius' actions with growing alarm. An invasion was only a matter of time. Desiring an end to the conflict, Cassander sent envoys to Antigonus in Syria offering peace. Yet Antigonus had no intentions of stopping. There would be no peace unless Cassander gave up all his belongings to the Antigonid kingdom. Wow. The message reached Cassander in 302 BC, and he naturally refused. I wonder where Antigon Antigonus and Demetrius want to stop, you know? Are they just willing to take Cassander's land, or are they going to push into here as well? I know they want all of Ptolemy's uh, land. Of course they want everything over here. Do they want everything that Alexander the Great had it? and more? I mean, how greedy are they going to get? War was inevitable, and he now called for aid from his neighboring Macedonian ruler in Thrace, Lysimachus. Lysimachus's role in the previous wars had been almost non-existent, as he had been prioritized with a lingering barbarian threat across the Danube River. Yet this was all about to change. Now, Lysimachus traveled to Pella to aid Cassander. They dispatched envoys to strengthen the alliance against Antigonus further, to Ptolemy in Egypt and Seleucus in Asia. Oh, wow. The grand coalition against Antigonus was beginning to take shape. Ptolemy quickly accepted the offer and prepared his army once more. Yet Seleucus's reply would take much longer to reach them. At the time, Seleucus was far away in India, campaigning against the Mauryan king, Chandragupta. Yet the war did not go well for Seleucus, and after suffering a defeat against Chandragupta, he was forced to give up his most eastern lands to the Mauryan Empire. In return, Seleucus received a staggering 500 Indian war elephants. Wow. With these beasts in tow, Seleucus began to march back to the heartlands of his empire in Mesopotamia. The crazy part is uh, these war elephants, they were just incredibly deadly in battle. I mean, armored giant elephants, you know? People could ride on them, people could shoot from them, just all that. It's insane. Not long after he departed India, the envoys from Cassander finally reached Seleucus's army and asked for his assistance. Seleucus accepted the call and commenced his long journey towards Asia Minor. Meanwhile, back in the west, the first move against Antigonus had been made. Two armies, under the command of Lysimachus and Cassander's best general, Prepolaeus, had launched a surprise attack on Antigonus, invading Asia Minor and quickly capturing much Antigonid territory in the west. <laughs> Antigonus had been residing at his capital at Antigonia when he heard of Lysimachus' unexpected invasion. Although now 80 years old, he quickly prepared Jesus. to lead his army once more. He was 80 at the time? That's, I mean, that's old for nowadays. Think about back then. That's incredible. Arriving in Asia Minor in the autumn of 302 BC, Antigonus pursued Lysimachus' forces around the Anatolian Plateau. Eventually, however, winter descended and both forces retired to await the spring. Yet it would be then that news reached Antigonus that would turn his plans upside down. In record timing, Seleucus and his great army had arrived in Asia Minor. Oh, and if more moving information too. on his march had survived, we would likely regard it as one of the most fascinating military achievements in history eclipsing that of even the great Hannibal Barker over the Alps. Really? Pressing on, Seleucus soon reached Lysimachus, and they united their armies. As for Ptolemy, he and his army at that time were besieging the Antigonid city of Sidon in Syria. Yet he would advance no further, as a false rumor had reached his ears that the armies of Seleucus and Lysimachus had been crushed by Antigonus. Believing the rumors, Ptolemy returned to Egypt with his army. Oh, wow. 
back in Asia Minor. Realizing that he was now greatly outnumbered thanks to Seleucus's arrival, Antigonus sent word to Demetrius, ordering him and his army to cross over from Greece and join him for the impending showdown. Demetrius duly obeyed, and having landed at Ephesus, he quickly recaptured many of the cities on the coast that had defected to Lysimachus. He then joined his father at Kelinae. With both forces... He needs to get over here. Cassin... Cassander? Cassander? Whatever. Substantially reinforced, they now awaited the spring and the climactic battle that would soon occur. As the winter subsided, on the plain near the town of Ipsus in Phrygia, the two great armies collided. Wow. I wonder how many troops Antigonus had in his army 70,000 infantry. Never mind. Mostly heavily armed pikemen who were battle-hardened from many previous campaigns. These he deployed in the center of his line, along with the best mercenaries money could buy. On his right wing, Antigonus placed Demetrius in charge of 5,000 of their finest cavalry, among whom was the young, exiled Molossian king, a man called Pyrrhus. On his left, Antigonus deployed the remaining 5,000 of his horsemen, and in front of his line, Antigonus placed his 75 war elephants, with light infantry stationed close by protecting the beasts. Hmm. Seleucus and Lysimachus's army was similarly large. In their center, they deployed their own infantry, 64,000 strong. Many once again were armed in the Macedonian manner, although Seleucus's infantry consisted mostly of various Asian levies, hailing from his kingdom's heartlands in Mesopotamia to Bactria and the Hindu Kush in the east. They equally divided their cavalry on both flanks, placing 7,500 horsemen on each Okay, wing. so they have a lot more troops. As for his elephants, Seleucus deployed a portion of them in front of the army line. The rest he kept in reserve. Seleucus also had a number of scythe chariots, but they were not used. So they had about 10,000 more troops mathematically. The battle commenced with an elephant charge by both sides, with the infantry following up close behind. Meanwhile, Demetrius ordered his elite cavalry wing to charge their opposing horsemen, which were under the command of Seleucus's son, Antiochus. Quickly overwhelmed, Antiochus and his cavalry retreated from the fight, with Demetrius in hot pursuit. In the center, the phalanxes had engaged, and very quickly the experienced foot soldiers of Antigonus began to push those of Lysimachus and Seleucus back. You know what I don't get? I don't understand how you get so overwhelmed. Back then, you're on a big open field, and if you see a bunch of cavalry charging at you, you'd think, oh shit, I have to do something. Like, I understand, yeah, I guess, getting overwhelmed, but to the point that, like, you, you don't even really start the attack, you know? Yeah, you don't start to defend. It just, it doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. An Antigonid victory looked likely. Yet it would be then that Seleucus used his secret weapon. Having finally called off the pursuit, Demetrius reorganized his cavalry and started to return to the battlefield, intending to crash into the enemy infantry line from behind. Yet Seleucus had anticipated the move. As soon as he saw Demetrius returning, he deployed his 300 war elephants in reserve to block wow. the young Antigonid's path. Demetrius's cavalry was blocked and powerless, their mounts unwilling to charge directly into elephants. Seleucus now gave the fateful order. He ordered their light cavalry, equipped with javelins and bows, to wheel round onto Antigonus's now exposed right wing and hail a rain of missiles into the dense Antigonid phalanx from its weak flank. Oh, wow. Outflanked and unprotected, Antigonus's army soon crumbled. Oh, it looks like they defected, Antigonus too. himself remained on the field until the end. Even as the enemy forces approached, 
he never gave up hope that Demetrius would return and turn the tide of battle. Yet Demetrius never came, contained by Seleucus's great beasts. Never losing confidence in his son, Antigonus perished in a shower of enemy javelins. Oh, wow. The man who at multiple times in the past 20 years had controlled great swathes of Alexander the Great's empire was no more. There ended the Battle of Ipsus. So how does it split? Antigonus lay dead on the field, and his son, despairing, fled to Greece. From there, Demetrius and his descendants would continue the fight, eventually taking control of Macedonia for the next hundred years. Oh, really? Antigonus had been very close to achieving the nigh impossible goal of reuniting Alexander's empire. Yet with his death, a new epoch began, and Alexander's former empire was forever fragmented between the remaining successors, never to be reunited again. Mm. As for the victors of Ipsus, they enjoyed the spoils of war, dividing Antigonus's vast lands in Asia Minor and Syria between them. Yet almost straight away, new quarrels stirred up. In Syria, immediately the seeds for a new dispute between Seleucus and Ptolemy arose. Each would claim control, with neither giving ground. War once again loomed. Hmm. That's about it, yeah. Ipsus was the end of one era of Hellenistic warfare, but also the beginning of the next. And in our future videos, we will discuss the Pyrrhic, Macedonian, and Syrian wars. So make sure that you are subscribed to our channel. All right, you guys, let's have a chat about that. Uh, and I do plan on watching those at some point in the future. Um, I would also like to watch why were Alexander's body and tomb so important. Uh, it seemed like an interesting video. Uh, that being said, I, I figured at the beginning of this video either... Antigonus would win all the land, or they, he would get killed, and his land would get divided. But, and I hadn't heard of him winning everything. Um, not that I really know much about the history of the era, but uh, I feel like, I don't know, maybe I would have heard about that. So I, uh, I assumed he was going to lose, and I guess, I guess I'm right. But uh, I didn't see it quite like that, you know? Um, that being said, I think it was a blast. I'm super excited. I hope you guys stick around because I do have some fun videos coming up in the next couple days. Uh, but anyway, till next time, this is Ace is High, and I'm out.